Okay, it's good to have everyone with us this evening, and we'll prepare ourselves this evening in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming privately to God the Father in the unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that you've given us, and they fly by so quickly. We thank you that we can slow down, breathe deep, and prepare to delve into your mighty word. It is indeed alive and powerful. We thank you that we can understand the whole realm of doctrine because of your grace. And now we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. <coughs> Excuse me. While y'all are doing that, I, I forgot I was going to mention, and we just had a report that Dot Moni had fallen, had fell, and what was it? Her elbow is broken? dislocated or anyway she's in the emergency room right now let's let's go into prayer one time real quick for her father we're so thankful that for dot and pete what wonderful examples of what marriage is is to be we pray for her that she will be able to endure the pain, that you'll give her the grace that she needs. We pray for the doctors that they will make the right assessment and do the things that will help her and do her no harm. We pray for Pete as well. We know this is hard on him, and we just pray that they will continue to faith rest and be uh, completely and totally at ease and secure and calm and confident. We thank you for these things and pray for them. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to put this on the board. This is the last verse of chapter 6, which we finished last time. I want to remind you on this verse. I've done it once, maybe twice, but this might be the third time. I don't know. The way that I like to use this verse and to quote it is by first quoting Romans 3.23, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, of course, that's not good news, but it's a setting up position for Romans 6.23. They're easy to remember. They both have the verse 23. They're both in Romans. So you go from Romans 3.23 to Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. And they're thinking, oh, more bad news. But what comes next is colossal. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. That last phrase there, that last part of the sentence. The free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. Any verse that has a gift in it, you really want to point that out because the great masses of people don't think that it's a gift. In fact, they're in an enterprise of working in every way they can to be good enough to enter God's heaven, which is the exact opposite way that they are going to get there. It's not by what we work for, it's for what we believe or who we believe in. So I just wanted to go back there and bring that to your attention again. I'm going to scroll a little bit. Because we're going to start in Romans chapter 7 tonight, right here. Romans chapter 7. I have quite a few, well, not a, 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 a massive amount, but I, I'm going to introduce this with some, some very important principles that are contained in chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 1 through 6 concludes with the major points that were made in chapter 6. 
Now, chapter 6 was phenomenal in the sense of what we learned that God has done for us. That we died with him on the cross and also we died to sin on the cross. Our old man, the one we were before we believed the gospel, was crucified on the cross. A lot, we're, that's a lot of baggage left behind. And that was necessary to happen for God to give us the things that we need to have. And everything that we need, he gives us. So he begins by pointing out the futility of depending on the law to be right with God. Right off the bat, first verse, that's what he's going after. And a lot of this, I'll show you an outline in a little bit. But most of this is has to do with the relationship of a Christian with the law. And he starts out right in the very first verse. This is a huge area where people have got it wrong. When you're walking in a crowd and you're just surveying the crowd and you have you ever thought, I wonder how many believers are out there? Well, there's probably a lot less believers than you may think because there are multitudes of people that go to church, they profess to be Christians, and they pray and they do all these things, but they are still relying on works to be acceptable before God. And sometimes they don't even realize it themselves, but when you talk to them, you ask them the right questions, it will come out. So many people look at Christianity, or, or the Christian way of life, as a do-it-yourself project. A lot of people are out there trying to live the Christian way of life, and it's a do-it-yourself project. They keep, they think keeping the law and maintaining moral standards is the way to success in executing the Christian way of life. I, I think we'd be shocked if we knew how many people who are professing Christians, and yet the way that they're trying to, to be accepted by God and to live the Christian way of life, there are two things there. First, by keeping the law, which we all know is what? Impossible. And to live uh, in a way that they maintain the highest moral standards. What do moral standards have to do with the gospel, with being saved? Nothing. Zero. There are millions upon millions of unbelievers there that are very moral. Many times they're more moral than Christians. And they're not saved. So it can't, it can't have anything to do with salvation. Now, God would expect of us to be moral, but it just simply doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Over time, they found out that doesn't work. It doesn't take long either. They think, well, I'm going to live the moral life. I'm going to take the high road, the high ground. And they can't achieve that any more than they can achieve obeying the law. And it shows eventually. But they haven't been taught. They don't know anything else. So they just keep clinging to keeping the law and being as moral as they can and cross their fingers and hope they make it to heaven. What a plan. We can do nothing on our own to live a life that is pleasing to God and we desperately need his grace and the ministries of the Holy Spirit to have any success in such an endeavor. See, it's not a do-it-yourself thing. It's a depending on the Lord type thing. And when I say we desperately need his grace, We'll see here shortly that with him, he tells us we can do zero. We can do nothing apart from the Lord Jesus Christ 
and the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's get that up front and have it blatantly demonstrated by the Scriptures. We cannot do anything apart from Jesus Christ and the ministries of the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to fulfill the things that God would have us do. Now, that seems obvious to us, doesn't it? I doubt that there's anyone here, or probably most of those that are live streaming, they pretty well know that. But we can't take it for granted because we are in a very small minority. Because religion is all about working your way up to a point to where you are accepted by God or by um, Allah or Buddha or whoever else it might be, but not Christianity. We are totally 100% dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit every single tick of the clock every single day. I'd like for you to turn to John 15.4 in your Bibles. John 15.4. I have it on the board, but you might want to make a notation. John 15.4. Who is this talking? Who? Jesus? Right, Jesus Christ. And so right off the bat, we have an imperative mood. It's a command. Abide in me. Another way of saying that is stick with me. Spend time with me. Concentrate on me. Learn from me. Make me your priority. All that is encapsulated in the word abide in me. Think about me. <clears throat> Abide in me and I in you. How about that? Jesus Christ abides in us and we abide in him. In fact, he is in us. Of course, this is strange to the natural order of things. You think, how can Jesus Christ be inside of us? How can the Holy Spirit be inside of us? How can God the Father be inside of us? We can't figure out physically. We take it on faith spiritually. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Branches are not the things that produce fruit. They hold the fruit, fruit, fruit and the nourishment comes through the branches to get to the fruit, but it doesn't produce the fruit. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, it needs to have help, unless it abides in the vine. Now the vine is the one that's soaking all the nourishment and everything up through the trunk of the tree, and it goes into the branches you know I I learned something about trees and the branches and so forth now Carrie and I live in a place uh, closest to us two miles from us is green vine and when I bought my place Carrie and I went out we were cleaning out the nothing had been done to it it was just raw and we had some grapevines and they were up to maybe, I don't know, four or five inches uh, 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 in, uh, across, and I was getting, uh, I was going to clean them out, and I would cut that vine, and it was like cutting a plumbing line. And I wasn't under pressure, but it was just pulling out of there, and I couldn't believe, I, looked, I didn't expect that. It was, it was coming out. I mean, you could catch it in a, in a bowl. And it, it went for a long time like that, and then it would start dripping and everything. And I was so impressed how a, a, a vine like that 
could get the water and the nourishment and everything up out of the ground and take it in this conduit of this vine going over, and it was like 20, 30 feet long. It was going all over the place. What about the great redwoods that, how tall are they? 700 feet, something? And that same thing is bringing all that up there. Anytime you just stop and start looking, this is a great time of year to do that. I normally cut all our grass by the uh, left part of our house there because I have a bad boy and I like to get on there and I run over everything. But we have these purple things that came up. I guess they're flowers. I don't know. And I noticed that there were um, butterflies all over in there, just flying in there and all. I thought, well, I, I can't, I can't cut that off because that's there where they're getting, out, getting their food or whatever it was. And I watched them several days. And of course, with flowers or butterflies, they don't usually last all that long. But it was a treat to me to see them do their thing. And then here came some bees, and then you got the birds. And you, I mean, it's, it's, you just sit there and look at God's creation. And it, look at a tree. It's, it's amazing. That's, that's when you can start to understand this in even a better way. Because all of that, every bit of everything, depends on Jesus Christ. He keeps it all going. It was created for him, and it is upheld by him. And it's a sight to see. I'm so glad that he made the, the, his creation in color. Can you imagine what it would be if it was all black and white, just gray or whatever? And everywhere you go this time of year, you see color, beautiful colors. And it doesn't matter. You can go into the depths of the ocean. Uh, Carrie and I have been on a couple of trips and went scuba diving, not scuba diving, but um, snorkeling. And the water was so clear, you couldn't even tell it was water. And these, all these fish, that integral, intricate little designs and beautiful. And the thing of it is, you know, if you're uptight and you're worried about something, now that means anything to you. And that's sad. Because that's the really spice of life right there. Even in the heavens, the stars. You just look up at the stars, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star. But when you look closely, especially if you have a telescope, beautiful colors. Some of them are brilliant blue. Some of them are red. This planet Mars, you can see it easy because it is, stands out in its redness. Anyway, um, I got all this when I got into, if you're wondering where to go from here, is when uh, we abide in the vine and in, in nature. So he says, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. You cannot produce fruit. You cannot go anywhere in God's plan unless you don't just stay for a moment or two or go to a church service or two or read your Bible once a month. It's talking about abiding in me. You can't do anything apart from me. If you, go, if you want to execute the Christian way of life, you have to abide with me, stay with me, think about me, focus on me. Look at the word, learn the word, apply the word. That all is in abide. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. Now, that's, all this was for this last part. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Zero. And so all these believers who are uh, built yourselfers, they're going to live the Christian way of life by their own way. In the spiritual realm, they're doing nothing. They're, work, they're, they're doing worse than nothing. It would be better if they didn't do it, that they would do nothing apart from trying to do it on their own because it's impossible. Keeping the law. You see, we're not, the first verse is talking about the law, but I'm preparing us for it. Keeping the law, for an example, the Ten Commandments. Keeping the law like the Ten Commandments is what millions of unbelievers and believers do to be acceptable to God. But it is done by their effort alone. God is left out. Have you ever thought about that? 
for people who are working in order to get in God's good graces it, are to be saved or to be accepted by him, who's doing the work? They are. They're doing all the work. But it is... A, <coughs> so there are millions of unbelievers and believers are trying to keep the law to be acceptable to God, but it is done by their effort alone. God is left out. Do you understand that? They say, oh yeah, but I'm working for God. Yeah, what did you say? Who's doing the work? They're doing the work. Where is the grace when brothers are doing the work? There's none, is there? They don't understand grace. They don't know that it is what he does for us and through us that matters. Let me repeat that. If you want to serve the Lord, if you want to grow to spiritual maturity, if you want to get rewards and decorations and privileges and opportunities for all eternity, you need to quit working your way and allow God to do things through you. Because he's the one that needs to be glorified, not you, not me. I don't think this ever comes in people's mind. They don't know that it is what God does for us and through us that matters. What else, if it's not that, does it matter? If there's anything that is done in your life and it's not done by God or through you, is there any consequence to it? Is there anything worthy in it? No, it's nothing. Nor do they know that one reason the law was given to man was to demonstrate that we cannot keep it. So we need a Savior. Now there's a lot of reasons for the law, and the law is just, and the law is good. It helped Israel go from slavery to a nation. There's all these things that they needed to know. But the basic rudimentary reason for it is to demonstrate we cannot keep it. And therefore, we need a Savior. If we don't have a Savior and we can't keep, cannot keep the law, then we're headed for the lake of fire for eternity. I could put it that way. Nor do they know that believers are not under the law because they died to it when they were saved through what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. How many believers know that they are not under the law? Not many. And I'm talking about any law. Nor do they know the following verses. For instance, Romans 4, verse 5. Sound familiar, Scott? <laughs> now this is, if you haven't committed this verse to memory, you need to do it. It's one of the most powerful verses in the Bible. It's the only one that starts out with, to him who does not work. And when you have probably 90% of the people out there professing to be Christians and they're trying to maintain their salvation or attain their salvation by works, this gets their attention. Now, him who does not work. So if you're talking to someone and you ask them, are you saved? Well, I hope so. Well, are you going to heaven? I don't know. Probably. Well, what are you depending on? What do you have to do in order to make it to heaven? Oh, you have to be baptized and you have to be good. And you have to be volunteering for this and that. The whole laundry list. So when they're saying that, all you have to do is go to Romans 4 or 5 and say, now to him who does not work, to, oh, excuse me, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. How would you like for an employer that when you were working, a, let's say, a 40-hour week, and you went to get your paycheck and you got more debt? That doesn't sound like a deal, does it? Verse 5, but to him who does not work, 
but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his what is credited for righteousness? Faith. Believing. That's it. Now, if you ever have a chance to stand before an unbeliever and you're trying to explain to him that his works are for naught, and you quote this verse to him and don't let him slither away. You need to hold his feet to the fire on this verse because you can say, you just told me that you needed to work in order to have salvation, in order to be saved. And this verse says that to the one who does not work is justified by faith. Can you explain this to me? You're saying that you have to work. This is saying you don't have to work. You're saying that you have to produce good deeds in order to get into heaven. And this says all you need is faith. Because faith is counted as righteousness. And if you're righteousness before God, why are you working? You're already righteous because of your faith. This is what we need to do. Because a lot of times when you, when you have a verse like this that demonstrates vividly that their, what they believe is wrong and they want to change the subject, don't let them change the subject. Say, now wait, before we leave this, we have to get straight. This says to the one who does not work but believes on him is justified. And you're saying it takes works. Now explain to me that this verse is wrong and you're right. I'm all ears. I want to hear it. It's simply, it's simple really. We are not considered to be righteous before God by our works, but through our faith. That's simple, isn't it? It is impossible to be right with God by working, but it is guaranteed by believing. I would guess that most people out there have never heard just that little bit that I've given you in the last five or ten minutes. They don't know that that even exists. They don't even think it's possible. That's why we have to slow down and drill down and make sure they understand. This is what the Bible says. You're saying you have to work. This says that you don't work. You're saved by faith. This is a quote from Warren Worsby, Outlines of the New Testament. To be under law means that we must do something for God. To be under grace means that God does something for us. Quite a difference, isn't it? Too many Christians are burdened with, re with religious rules and regulations and good resolutions, not realizing that it's impossible to find holiness through their own efforts. How tragic it is to see Christians living under law, striving in their own efforts to please God, when the new position they have in Christ and the new power in the Spirit, Romans 8, 3 through 4, make it possible for them to enjoy victory and blessings by grace. They're over there still working and in through their own effort, trying to impress God, trying to get whatever they can, and they don't know in their position in Christ it automatically makes it possible for them to enjoy victory and blessings of grace. How many believers are in that category? They really did believe their, the gospel. They put their faith alone in Christ alone. But now, what do you do now? Well, you got to be, you got to be moral. You got to follow the law. You got to be as good a person as you can and hope that God sees it. That's balderdash. That's lies. And they need to hear from you, they need to hear from me, that when you are saved, you don't work in order to get something that you already have. I'm going to read this again, This just this part of it. I really like it. To be under the law means that we must do something for God. To be under grace means God does something for us. Which would you rather be under?
Paul presents the institution of marriage to demonstrate the difference between constraints and obligations of marriage compared to the freedom of being single. I think I understand why a lot of people are hesitant to get married. Especially women. Because if they understand what marriage is, it is an awesome commitment. And it lasts for your entire life. And you will be under the authority of your husband until you die or until he dies. And I'm not running down marriage. Marriage is great. But there are constraints and obligations that never leave you. Your responsibilities to your spouse never end. Now that doesn't mean that marriage is bad. It doesn't mean, mean that it's not phenomenal. But you're not free like you are when you're single. And there are, of course, ups and downs. And if you're single, so you get lonely. What's really bad is when you're married and you're lonely. There's a lot of them out there like that. So he's going to do that in the second verse. He's going to present marriage in order to show the difference between constraints and obligations of marriage. By the way, I reworded that. I saw this in another place, and it said, uh, Paul presents the institution of marriage to demonstrate the bondage of marriage. I thought, mm, I don't think I like that word, bondage. And I think constraints and obligations is a better fit. Okay, here's the outline of chapter 7. And chapter, chapter 7 it has to do with conflict and sanctification. Now, sanctification is what? What happens after the cross. Justification is what happens at the cross. And we're not going to be spared that there is conflict in sanctification as you are living out your life and you are trying to learn how to trust God and grow in grace and knowledge and those type of things. There's going to be conflict for Number one, the believer and the law is chapter 7, verse 1 through 6. That's about the believer and the law. Chapter 2 has to do with the law and sin. Chapter 7, verse 7 through 13. And third is the believer and sin, verses 7, 14 through 25. Now you might be thinking, why are we still on the law and sin? We've been on that, it seems like, forever. Well, each chapter we learn more about it. It's in chapter 6 that we found out that we died to sin. And sin has no, 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 no longer any domination over us. That's good news. This is a, the following poem will be help to, uh, will help us prepare for chapter seven. I just kind of liked it and it's setting it up for us. It's very short, but I think it's pretty, pretty neat. It says, to dwell above with the saints in love. Oh, that will be glory. But to stay below with the saints I know, that's another story. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, there's a truth to that, is it not? That's one reason there is, what was it up here? Um, where is, oh yeah, conflict and sanctification. By the way, you know who came over that? J. Vernon McGee. Y'all remember J. Vernon? He had a good poem. In it. Okay, here we are. Fill with the introduction, and we're going to start verse 1 of chapter 7. Or do you not know, brethren? What does that tell you? He's, he's addressing believers, and he's saying, or do you not know? Well, he asked them that if he hadn't already taught it. I think that he already taught it, and maybe they weren't acting like they heard it, and so he's telling them in a way, 
Do you not know this, brethren? For I am speaking to those who know the law. We'll comment on that in a minute. That the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. That's what I was talking about a moment ago about women when they get married. They're going to be under their, uh, their husband's authority as long as they live. But on the other side of the coin, the husband is responsible for loving his wife until he dies. Neither one of those things can happen apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, by the way. Even as lovely as your wife is, and as nice as she is, and kind and patient, she got all these things, there are, there's going to be turmoil. There's going to be times when there is acrimony because she wants it to be white and you want it to be black and neither one of you are ready to give in. That's a formula for disaster. Many times it's because the husband, because he's just a jerk. But that does not dismiss the responsibility of his wife to go along with his decision. You see, when a wife is right and she goes ahead and complies with her husband, what he says, this is the best for us, she is automatically blessed because she did that. Because the word of God commands her to do it. And she's trusting God to work it all out rather than attacking her husband and say, you're a dope, we've got to do it this way. Paul's readers lived in the capital of the empire where officials debated, enacted, and enforced laws. Of all people, they were very familiar with legal matters. So when we're looking up here in this parenthetical thought, for I am speaking to those who knew the law, he didn't have to explain the law or introduce the law. They very well knew the law. Although Paul intends to include God's written law, he is not referring to any specific law code, but to the principle that is true of all law, whether it's Greek, Roman, Jewish, or biblical. Did you know that's what he's talking about, the law? When he says you're not under the law, he's not just talking about the Mosaic law, he's talking about any law, because any law you can take and think, I'm going to get closer to God by obeying this law. And hopefully by now, we all recognize that's impossible. That's the wrong way to go. Now what jumped out at me in this verse, it says that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. So let's look at the word jurisdiction. It's kariuo in the Greek. That's K-U-R-I-E-U-O. It's a verb, present, active, indicative. So this jurisdiction is ongoing. As long as you live, it's still there. Active voice, the law is the one that has the active voice of jurisdiction. Indicative mood means this is a reality. So this is the definition of jurisdiction. To be master of, dominate. Those are strong words, aren't they? We don't really like to have anyone to be master or dominate us, and yet that's what the law, the Greek word here for jurisdiction, for the law, that's what it is. This verse refers to legitimate laws. Now listen to this. I have to throw this in because some people think they have to obey every law. And the Bible does not say that. It says just the opposite. This verse refers to legitimate law or natural law. Do you know what natural law is? Natural law is pertinent to every person on the globe and it supersedes any other law. It's the highest law there is. It's God's law. It's natural law. And we know that we are under it through our conscience. So this verse refers to that kind, <clears throat> excuse me, that kind of law. If, if a law is immoral, unconstitutional, or requires one to do something that he, that the Bible condemns, it is null and void, illegitimate, 
And God does not require us to obey it. How many believers do you think understand that? How many believers do you think would stand against a law that is immoral, ungodly, and unconstitutional? How many think that God has, that they have God's approval when they say, no, thank you, we're not going to obey that. It's not a law. But if it is those things, it's not a law. And whoever wrote that law, whoever signed it into force, broke their oath to the Constitution and to God and to us, and they are criminals. They broke the law. So if a law is immoral, unconstitutional, or requires one to do something that the Bible condemns, it is null and void on its face, illegitimate, and God does not require us to obey it. He never requires us to comply with evil or submit to abuse. Do you know that? Throughout the whole Bible, he never requires us to do that. What kind of God would he be? Could he be a fair and just God if he commanded us, go ahead and take the uh, abuse and go ahead and comply with evil. That would be going against everything that he is. When anyone in government goes directly to the people and requires them to comply with what they demand, they are breaking their oath to the Constitution, they are committing a criminal act, and the people could and should ignore it. And boy, do we have a lot of those that we've seen in the last year and a half. I don't know how many times I've talked to people and I've told them, if, if the law is unconstitutional, even the Supreme Court has upheld it time after time, that is null and void in its face. It has no force it's as if it was never written. And yet they say, oh, but you're breaking the law. I said, no, you don't, get a, you don't understand. It's not a law. Government leaders must take their petitions to Congress to go through a process to pass a bill in order a bill into law before the people are required to obey it. And it's not just our president, it's not just our governors, it's not all just here in America. Across the whole globe, they have people in the highest of office and they're directing and commanding the people to do things straight directly to them. The reason this country was founded and the way, reason we have a Congress and a Supreme Court and the executive branch, we have three ch branches that check each other to make sure that won't happen. Nobody in government, no one can go right to you and say, you go do so-and-so. You can say, well, show me, the, show me the law. Show me that you've gone through the proper press process for this to become a law. I'll read that again. Government leaders must take their petitions to Congress to go through a process to pass a bill into law before the people are required to obey it. And if it is unconstitutional, it is null and void, and the people's duty is to ignore it. Even when they pass a law, and it's unconstitutional. When it's unconstitutional, it means they're breaking the law, and it means it's ungodly. It's not only our right, it's our duty to ignore it. How many, how many laws have been passed over the years by our Congress that have gone into force that should be null and void because they don't have the constitutional right to do it? One that stands out in my mind was in 2015 when the Supreme Court came up with a grand idea that the constitutional grants people rights, the right to marriage, same-sex the same-sex people to, to be married. And that was contested and went to the Supreme Court. Now, oh, yeah, yeah, it's constitutional. First of all, marriage is not even stated in the Constitution. It's a state issue to begin with. And yet, that's the order of the day. So, the people should, uh, their duty is to ignore it. That would include lockdowns. That would include mask mandates and all the dictates 
that are included in executive orders, all of those are null and void, and they were criminals to do it. They had no constitutional right to do it. And if there were any governors or mayors that could interdict and intercede, and all they would have to do is say, look, we're not going to comply with this. We're going to ignore it. Show me where you have the constitutional right to, to dictate to the people these kind of things and we'll obey them. It's not there. Not that happened, did it? Now the people are just looking down the barrel of all these petty dictators wherever they are and they comply with it because they don't understand that God does not require us to bow down and be abused by tyrants. And we don't, have, I'm not talking about rebellion. I'm just talking about standing for righteousness, which God expects us to do. And it's, it's abhorrent to me to think that all these people for over a year have been getting by with these, these abominations, ruining people's families. How many people have died? How many people are desperate because of these things? When all they had to do is say, I'm not going to comply with this. I'm going to continue to work. And I'm not going to get a mask. And I'm not going to get the, the, uh, bar, uh, the, uh, what is it, the, the shot. I mean, these are not rebellious people. These are people who recognize they have no right. They have no authority. They're going against God. They're going against the Constitution. And they're going against us. And people are still complying, mainly because they're afraid. And fear like that is a sin. I got one more like this, if y'all can take it. One more paragraph. Anyone who carries out these dictatorial orders are breaking their oath to the Constitution, to God, and to the people. They are just as evil as the tyrants who order them to prey on the people. They are as despicable as the Gestapo of Hitler's Germany. Is that hard enough for you? I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking about that's the truth. If these police or sheriffs or whoever it was, that the, the deputies that went out to enforce these despicable, unconstitutional, ungodly laws, and usually they would say, well, uh, I'm just following orders. Yeah, that's what the uh, mass murderers in World War II claimed that Nuremberg at the at the judgment of Nuremberg and they were executed. Anytime you follow orders that are preying upon the people, that is worthy of death and they receive death. The reason I put that there and it was so I know I used the, the best skill that I could to make them look as despicable as they are because some usually nobody even says anything about them. What if the police department says, now I want you to go out there and I want you to take these people who are not locking down their businesses and you bring them here. Use force if you have to, whatever it takes. Let's say the police department had a hundred officers and 95 of them says, you take a hike. I'm not going to break my oath to office in order to placate you, you tyrant. That would make a difference, wouldn't it? It wouldn't have happened. They, they're not going to go enforce it themselves. But they have their lackeys go out there and they face the people. They're, con they're, they're neighbors, fellow Americans. And they force upon them calamity. Sometimes the, they go out of business and they're, it's just so despicable. I wanted to put that in there because we're talking about the law has jurisdiction. And that is talking about legitimate law. It's the same thing in Romans 13. It's talking about legitimate law. And the people, God in Romans 13 is explaining the way that God designed a, a government to work. And he says the people who are in government are his ministers. They're good. They're there for the people's good. Well, I said I'd stop, so I'm going on. But you know why I did that now. Okay. There were both Jews and Gentiles in the local church in Rome. Both understood the authority of the law. So we're talking about, in our verse, in verse 1, 
Or do you not know, brother? For I am speaking to those who know the law. So there were Jews and there were Gentiles, and both of them were very familiar with the law. They were different types of law, but they both recognized that the law had power over them. So they're both Jews and Gentiles in the local church in Rome. Both understood the authority of the law. But the Jews were probably more likely to depend on keeping the law than the Gentiles were in order to be saved. Church-going legalists, unbelievers, are usually harder to reach with the truth of the gospel than unchurched unbelievers because they have invested, a lot. that is the ones that are legalistic unbelievers going to church. You understand there's a lot of those out there, don't you? And what I'm saying is uh, those people are harder to reach with the truth because they have invested a lot of time and effort in working to be saved. So they're not very interested in accepting the truth that they could have they could have had uh, been saved simply by believing Jesus Christ. Do you understand why they don't want to let go of their works? They've been spending decades upon decades. They're kind of keeping the tally. I did this and I did that and I, I, I could have done this. And, I, and they don't understand. When you just come up and say, hey, you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And in their mind, they're thinking, well, what about all that good work I did? Did I do that for nothing? Yes. But they're too proud to, to acknowledge that. So they're, they're hardened. They're harder to reach. Most of the time, unbelievers who don't go to church are more likely to accept the gospel because they know that their good works are not going to get them to heaven. They don't even pretend. They don't have to unlearn something. They don't have, they don't have a reed to, to lean on. So when you say, hey, all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. He took care of your sin problem. And the Bible says when you have faith in him, then you're born again. You're, you're saved. You've become a child of God. You are righteous before him. You have eternal life. All that for just believing in Jesus Christ. And they say, I'll take that. Uh, sign me up. But you go to a legalist, unbeliever, maybe even a believer in a church, and you're trying to explain to them that it's all by faith, it's by grace. Well, you don't know how hard I've worked in all the Sunday schools I've done. I've done this and I've done that. It's harder for them to let go of that, you see? That's why they're harder to reach. At least it's my opinion that they are. Paul used an illustration concerning marriage to support his premise that believers are not under the law because they died to the law. You know that Romans, and we covered this, but I don't know if you remember or not, Romans 6, 14, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. We are not under the law. Am I just talking about the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law? No. God doesn't pat us on the head for keeping any law. What God wants is is for us to love him and want to please him and voluntarily do that which he commands. That's a far cry from trying to attain, attain a salvation by you working. So the relationship that once existed between the believer and the law no longer exists. Why? Can you get it? Through your mind, we died to the law. We died to sin. Our old self is dead. Sin no longer has any power over us. And our life is not about keeping the law, but growing in grace and knowledge and taking advantage of God's grace and how he can work through us. None of that is legal business. That's family business. Uh-oh. What happened to that? <laughs> 
I'll read this. That's about all I have time for. This is verse 2. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. What he's demonstrating here is that why would we continue to have to, to think that we have to be under the authority of the law when the Bible says you're dead. If a person was in prison, he was a criminal, and the law said you've got to spend 30 years in there. I heard today of uh, the guy that, who was it? He shot three people. He, he tried to uh, kill three people, and he got 30 years is all he got. And, and they were injured and all, but and I'm thinking, that doesn't seem enough to me. But in any case, if you were a criminal and you've been in there for, let's say, 20 years, and you died, what can the law do about it? Huh? <laughs> Nothing. If you're dead, the law doesn't matter. You're not under that law anymore. And this is a great example. If you're dead, you're not under the law. And that's what I'm telling you through Paul. You're dead, and I'm dead, to sin, to the old man, to the, the, the old person we were, and to the old sin nature, and we are dead to the law. Our purpose is not to fulfill the law. Our purpose is to love the Lord Jesus Christ and obey him because we want to. We recognize that his mandates are for our good and we he loves us and we respond to that. Well, we gotta stop here. I'm out of time. Any questions for our end? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the book of Romans and all that it shows us. We have to slog through it. It's not easy, and there's a lot of things that have a spiritual dimension that are hard for us as physical beings to wrap our mind around. But it's a glorious thing when we finally realize that we are free from all of these things. Hallelujah. And now we get to serve the phenomenal, the I am, the God of the universe. We pray that we, these things will sink into our soul to the point where we can explain it to other people so they can understand as well and stop trying to be accepted by God by their own effort. It is impossible. If they are believers, they can relax and just thank God that they are his child and they want to to do whatever the Lord commands. Help us to meditate on that so we can tell others in our own words. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.